let's, um, can you hear me okay? That's on, yeah? Let's just stop a minute um, and reflect on what we just sang again there. He's alive. He's alive. Death has been defeated. Yeah? And so I'd like to just encourage you that as we think about some of the things this morning, we're not thinking about this is me saying these things. It is a living, moving, triumphant, risen Jesus Christ. Please receive these words this morning, not from me, but from the Lord, because he's alive. Now, of course, uh, some of you know me, others of you perhaps don't, so my name's Steph, and I'm sure already some of you will know I was a teacher for many years. People tell me I've tried to lose this for a long time, <laughs> sounding like a teacher, but it isn't going too well. So uh, I was a teacher for a long time. But I love the Lord, I love Jesus, and I love this church, and I love you guys. Uh, but because I'm a teacher, I thought we'd start off, Cheryl, with a bit of a test. <laughs> well, actually, to be truthful, it's not quite so much a test as a kind of a, an assessment, because we're moving now towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And there's been a lot of things we have been deeply challenged about, yeah? And the question is, how are you doing? Don't judge, don't worry, don't store up treasures on earth, don't look sad when you fast, don't be hypocritical. That's my big problem. And then chapter five in particular is full of You've heard it said, but I say to you, so and forth. So here we are, and I'd like you please to rank yourselves one to ten. One is rubbish, ten is, yeah, nailed it, all right? Just go through, in, on your own. S you, sorry? <laughs> um, you've got about two minutes, give yourself a quick mark out of ten. Seriously, go on, do it. Okay. So you're going to tell someone near you, you're the one you got the top mark for and the one you got the bottom mark for. All right? You can't, I shouldn't say you can lie, but you can. <laughs> top mark and bottom mark if you want to. If you're two, you've got zero on all of them. Don't worry, just sit quietly, okay? You could just, just quickly. <laughs> Right. Now, this is the question I have for you. Really, honestly, it doesn't matter. Truly, it doesn't matter. How do you feel about it does? How do you feel about where you gave yourself eight? And where you gave yourself one. As you have received the teaching on these uh, scriptures that Jesus himself taught, what have you actually done about it? So I remember last week being very impacted when Dave was teaching about not judging. What have I done about it? For you, those ones where you're bumping along near the bottom, what have you done about it? Does it matter? How do you feel about it? And don't forget the verse in 
chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 48, where Jesus says some terrifying things. Be ye perfect. Really? Be ye perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And also last week, we had a very salutary verse which says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only who, he who, what? What's the fill in the dots? Does the will of my Father is in heaven. So, you know, you could say, well, Steph, I'm trying really hard, actually. I know I need to be better. I know I'm not doing so good, but... Oh, it is really hard. And I think that this is what the disciples must have been feeling after the teaching of Jesus. I mean, in some of the other Gospels, the te these teachings are spread out a bit. Here they all come together, and it's a bit kind of, a little bit more difficult to get away from it. So before we get into the teaching this morning, I've got another question. It's a sort of an English question. And it's this, what is the difference between perseverance and persistence? What is the difference, oh, I can see, between perseverance and persistence? And again, just think a minute. Um, I don't want the answers up yet, Trowell. Um, <laughs> just perhaps talk about it. Or just continue to reflect. Anybody think there is a difference? Is there? <clears throat> okay, so the difference is really important for us this morning because this is about what is the persistent life, not the persevering life. And so we will have the slide. There is a difference. And um, it's here, explained. So I did teach Latin for a bit as well, so forgive me. <laughs> um, pers perseverance, pair, can mean here, very. It doesn't often, always, it doesn't in the next word, it means through, but it can mean very. And here it does, and se severe means, we get our word severe from it, means very strict. So the derivation of the word is very strict. Perseverance is something very strict. Persistence, actually it didn't come into the language, it came in through French in the 15th century. You don't want to know that, do you? But anyway. It means to continue with strength. To abide, continue steadfastly. We are not called to the persevering life. In some respects, perhaps we are, but we are called to the persistent life. And that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. So this passage, you'll be pleased to know, is not another challenge. It's not another occasion this morning where we're going to think, oh dear, something else I've got to try and do. It isn't the persevering life. What we're going to read this morning and think about is the secret to how we are going to fulfill the kingdom manifesto. It's how we're going to actually do it. It absolutely is not try harder. It isn't. I believe, in fact, in, in contrast to that, it's a word of life for us this morning. It's the exact opposite of could do better. It's about listening, do it my way. And I love to think of Jesus at this point looking at the crestfallen faces of his disciples and he comes out with this command, this, this, this little passage, which you know very well. I mean, these are some of the best known verses in the Bible. 
but I wonder if you really know them. So, Simon's going to read us the passage, hopefully. So it's from Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse uh, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Amen. Well, this is the word of God. That's what Jesus said. So the first uh, thing, there's three points I'm going to make that in a sense offer us keys for how we can live this kingdom life. And the first one is this. There is a promise, but it requires action. A promise that requires action. Ask, seek, knock. Now, those Bible scholars amongst us will know that this doesn't mean once. It means keep on asking. Ask and keep on asking. It is what in English is called the continuous present tense. You can say in English, I go or I am going, which is the continuous present. And so here, it's not seek once, but keep on seeking. Ask repeatedly. It's also an imperative, meaning it's a command. Do it, do it, not an option, do it. It's, I like the fact that it's a monosyllabic word, which means it's one syllable. Ask, knock, it should be easy. Now at face value, you might think, wonderful. It's some kind of um, endless Amazon wish list. I don't know how long your Amazon wish list is, but, you know, stick anything on there and you've got it. This is what this verse kind of might suggest. But we couldn't be more wrong. It is not about getting what we want, even if we persist. And I'm afraid one of the reasons is, again, lost in translation a little bit here, a little bit more of an English lesson. Do you remember what the subjunctive is? No. (laughs) <laughs> well, actually, in the original, if you put this the other way around, you'd get the emphasis better. So we should say, to receive something, comma, ask. To find something, comma, seek. To get the door open, comma, knock. And the emphasis is on the ask, the seek, and knock. Not the get, 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 get. Okay. So it's not about actually getting what we want. In fact, Dave Benson last week said something very helpful, which was about the importance in these verses of relationships, the one he was looking at last week. And by the way, just so we're clear, um, it wasn't last week, it was the week before, wasn't it? Last week, Stu, right took his verses slightly out of sequence. So we're going back a little bit. Okay, just, we do know that. It was for a practical reason because he couldn't be here this week. So we are going back just a little bit. But Dave explained that these sections are about relationships, not about getting what we want for ourselves. And Jesus actually is telling us how to live with those people around us. And so what these verses are doing, they are giving us the source of power and stability as we learn how to live a true Christian 
life of a disciple in what is a very fallen world. It's a series of three commands, really, on Christian character. So what about the ask? Let's think about that for a minute. Ask, keep on asking. A simple request for something perhaps I want or I need, you might think. For example, a child might say to their father, Dad, usually it's mum, isn't it? Dad, will you help me with my homework? Or they could be a little bit more persistent and do a bit of seeking, a bit more effort. They go to the garage where Dad's busy and say, Dad, will you help me with my homework? Or they could bang loudly on the study door. This has all happened in our house. Where loud worship music is being played or deep theological thoughts are being thought. And there's a banging on the door. Dad, help, I'm stuck. I need you to come now. Make that a little bit spiritual. Ask. Now, this is the point. What do we ask, seek, and not for? We ask to be nearer the ten than nearer the one. We ask to be more like Jesus. We ask to do things that are according to his will. So you might say, ask, which is an urgent petition. Could you help me be a better witness to my friend? Yes, it will be given. Or, I'm sorry I haven't spoken to you lately, God, but I know you remember me. So could you help me with my witness at work? Because this guy's really getting up my nose. Yes, you will help. Or, God, I'm desperate. Help! The door will be opened. It is straightforward. It will happen. By the way, we use the word will two ways in English, don't we? For the future, I will go, but also as a statement of a fervent belief. Um, will you love this woman? Blah, blah, blah. I will. Uh, and it's that I will, not the wishful thinking of the future. That is important. <clears throat> Are the words synonyms the same, meaning the same? Mm, no, actually not really, because they reflect a different measure of our determination to be persistent. There is a progression, there is a rising scale of intensity. Asking, increasing sincerity, active, diligent pursuit of God's ways. How good are we doing on active, diligent pursuit of God's ways? I know as far as I'm concerned, I ask once. And so my question to you partly this morning is, why don't we ask, seek, and knock? I've known about giving this talk for a long time. Have I asked about it? Have I sought about it? Have I knocked about it? So what stops us? Well, sometimes we're, we can't be bothered. We think we don't need to. Usually, we give up too soon. Maybe we don't believe it because we think in the Amazon wish list mentality. But I asked and I didn't get it. Well, sorry, but that was not what this verse is applying to. This isn't about petitions and intercession kind of prayer. This is about engaging with God, talking to him kind of prayer, yeah? Yeah. Uh, simply, we don't have, says James in chapter 4, because we don't ask. Um, I just want to sidestep for a minute. There was a, a, something that 
really impacted quite a few of us at New Wine, which was the story in 2 Samuel chapter 6 of Uzzah. And he was the guy who thought he'd put out his hand to study the ark. Yeah? But actually he was smitten because he shouldn't have. And we think, well, that's a bit harsh. But the reason was because we, it says, because we did not, he did not inquire of the Lord. And the way we ask and we seek and we knock is inquiring of the Lord. It's not a matter of our convenience. It's a matter of sacrificial faithfulness. It's a matter of intentional cultivation of that relationship with Jesus. So let's just take a minute. I'd like you just to close your eyes. I haven't finished, by the way. Don't get your hopes up. (laughs) Just close your eyes. Thinking back to that list at the beginning... I wonder what has been the result so far of this series. Where have you prayed for transformation? Where have you kept on? Where do you need to ask, seek and knock? Maybe that God would fulfill a calling He has for you. Ask. Maybe to empower you to live each day in his strength. Seek. Oh Lord, make me more like Jesus. Knock urgently. So open your eyes. So the first learning point, if you like, we always have to have learning points. I train teachers and we always have to have learning points. Our first learning point is this. Persistent prayer will be heard and will be answered. So let's move on quickly to number two, which is an example that encourages success. I love this passage, this little section of the Sermon on the Mount. How many times, parents, do your children say to you, I'm hungry, in the average day, if they're little? Or, wives, your husbands might say it. (laughs) Children ask us for things endlessly. They don't have a problem with it, and we do actually give them what is good for them, by and large. There was the time I gave my son Luke some dodgy ham and uh, he had such terrible food poisoning for his first A-level. This was not a good giving of sustenance to my child, but never mind. But generally speaking, we don't set out to do those sorts of things. So a child asked for something, you give them something good. And here we've got some examples. Now, this is called an a fortiori Example, argument. And it really means you go from one position to an even stronger one. It's a strong argument. And particularly here, it's an example where he says, let's put it another way. And you know, uh, you remember what it says. If you've got your Bibles, you can look. It says, how much more? So we have an example the father giving food, the how much more. I must just tell you one story where you'll be shocked. It always reminds me of this with the stone. You know, if your child asks for a stone, for a a bread, would you give him a stone? Don did once. (laughs) So we were on the beach at Pevensey Bay and um, he says to our eldest son, Philip, he was little, here, Phil, have a sweet. And Phil put it all lovely and trusting in his mouth. And it was a pebble. I was shocked. I was so upset about that. It's called the Pevensey Bay Pebble Story. And we love to rip Don about it because it was not uh, his finest moment. But um, (laughs) (laughs) 
anyway, generally speaking, we give our kids good things. Now, the a fortiori argument says, how much more? To us, it comes naturally as parents, how much more? Can it be more? Well, yes, it can be more. I think we're actually starting to see that we're pretty, not, pretty daft not to be making use of what Jesus is teaching us here. But there are a few things just to say about this. First of all, it says that we are given good gifts. Good gifts. What are these good gifts? And we know from a similar passage later in the, in the New Testament that actually the good gifts are the Holy Spirit. They are spiritual gifts. There's the, the, the business, uh, a, a story about the friend banging on his friend's door because he needs something. They are spiritual gifts we're talking about here. Secondly, to notice about this how much more, is that how much more speaks of God's generosity and you can, he never, ever stops. And thirdly, there's an important relational rule, and I think this is really important. Listen carefully to this assessment. Expectation without communication leads to frustration. Example, I'm sorry, Don, I'm using you <laughs> from my illustration. I might be in the garden. This is true. I've got bruise, bruises to show it. I'm in the garden. And um, my expectation is as follows. Don knows I need help cutting down the trees in the garden. He knows. Without communication, I don't tell him. I need help, and that I'm going to be actually be doing it today, and therefore I need his help for half an hour. Leads to frustration. <laughs> Where is he when I need him? How much better just to say, Don, I could really do with your help. Can you come and help me for half an hour? This is exactly what we do with God, though. Exactly what we do. Expectations. Oh, God knows I need this. He knows. He loves me. He knows. Expectations. Without communication. Leads to our frustration. Why isn't he helping me? Did you ask? Do you see? It's such a simple thing, but get a hold of it this morning. Have you communicated with God about this? Have you asked? Have you seek, sought him? Have you knocked? Ultimately, he wants a relationship with us. And that's what persistent prayer will help you achieve. And then... The next bit is about this golden wrong rule. If ever we needed help somewhere, it's with the golden rule. You all know about the golden rule, I'm sure. Yeah? No? A few, few blank pages. Well, the golden rule Jesus uh, is exactly what Jesus says in verse 12. Do to others what you would have them do to you. That, if we all did that, we'd, you know, England, Great Britain would be sorted, wouldn't it? Completely. Uh, it sums up the law and the prophets. This, somebody has suggested, is the actual peak of the Sermon on the Mount, the summation, the, the, the tip-top most important thing. And you can sort of get that, can't you? That all these things that Jesus has been teaching ultimately is for our benefit with people around us. Do to others. I mean, I love the story. It's a very old-fashioned book. I don't even know if you've all heard of The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley. Oh yes, we love The Water Babies. And um, it's, there's the protagonist in it is a little boy called Tom and he's a chimney sweep and it's very sad. Uh, and he meets a sort of more upper class girl 
named Ellie and he gets chased out of the house and he seems to drown, but he gets transformed into a water baby. And there he meets some very interesting characters and one of them is called Mrs. Do As You Would Be Done By. And Mrs. Do As You Would Be Done By teaches Tom quite a lot. She kind of sums up the golden rule, but even Paul had the most terrible trouble with following the golden rule. He says in Romans chapter 7, verse 19, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. I thought we could have a new character. Mrs. Do what I don't want to do. Rather than Mrs. Do as I would be done by. And Paul doesn't just ask. He doesn't just seek. He knocks. He says in Romans, who will rescue me from this body of death? And he gets his answer. Thanks be to God, he says, who gives us the victory. So to sum up this second section, persistent prayer is not for selfish ends. I had never, until I was really thinking about this, kind of understood how do as you would be done by, fitted in to this section. But now I can see it very clearly. It's the area where we most need to ask, seek, and to knock. So, two points we've learned, hopefully. Firstly, we can expect to live a kingdom life because we have a loving Heavenly Father who gives us good gifts. But we have to ask for, seek, and knock for them especially the ability to follow the golden rule, which is totally impossible without a father's help. But he gives much more. So finally, the last section, which is the bit about the um, straight and the narrow. And the Sermon on the Mount sort of ends with, with some warnings, doesn't it? And this is one of them. And this section actually tells us very clearly that there is a choice that we need to make, a choice that decides our destiny. And Jesus describes it in a choice of two roads. Now, I ha we have a series of these books on our shelves. Does anyone else love Wainwright? Anybody even heard of Wainwright? Shock, horror. Wainwright has written a whole series of walking guides to the Lake District. And as you know, Don's a trained mountain leader, and we have them all. And for many years now, we set off on our walks in the Lake District. And there's very intricate routes and paths, okay? Now, I have opened this one at the way up Skiddor. Skiddor's a great big mountain that dominates the Northern Lakes. We, we've been up there quite a lot. In fact, I, I, we always write little, I write little notes when we've done a walk. I, I wrote this. Walked up in snow, sun shining, spectacular, best walk ever, cold wind. <laughs> that was on the 31st of January in 2019. However, as some of you may know, if you know about Skiddle, there's two routes up. Well, more than that, actually, but there's two favourite ones. This guy, Wainwright, says this. This is a time-honoured route. He's got a little picture. It goes over grass. In popular use a century ago, the first path to a Lakeland mountain top to be trodden out distinctly Nowadays, it is in places as wide as a major road. It has been derided as a route for grandmothers and babies. The truth is, this is an ascent all members of the family can enjoy. That sounds nice, I think. Let's go that way. 
However, we turn the page. There's lots of different ways up written about. And I find instead we're going up a different way. Where is it? From Milbeck, we're going up. And it says... According to ordnance survey maps, the path formerly kept to the east bank of the Beck from the weir, but now the path climbs initially along the west bank before crossing. Join this new path by climbing left beyond the second gate by a not too obvious track instead of continuing to the weir. There is also a rough connecting track from the weir. We did actually get lost there. You're not surprised. This was the narrow way. I'm thinking the Broadway sounds lovely. It's for grandmothers. But somebody knows better. And we go the other way. And actually, finding the start is often the problem. It really is. I think there's a few heated words sometimes when we try to find the start. Small gate, narrow style. Could it, is it a sheep track or is it actually the path? On we go, twists, turns, crags, waterfalls, leaps over boulders. We do them all. And meanwhile, as I puff and pant, I glance to my right, where is the Broadway for grandmothers? <laughs> Why do I keep going on the narrow way? One, I have my eyes firmly fixed on my guide, and he's not, not lost me yet. Secondly, I know he will have found a good way that I will enjoy, because he knows me. And thirdly, I know we will reach the top. And that's why I keep going. Now, I forgive me for the analogy but do you see about the broad and the narrow way and the wonderful thing is I think for most of us here this morning although I wouldn't want to make this assumption we have gone through the narrow gate we are on the way so we don't have to worry too much about that but if anyone's here who doesn't know that they know very well they're on this broad way and it's up for a bit of an adventure with Jesus Come and talk to me afterwards. But most of us are on this way. Why don't we do so well on the narrow way sometimes, do you think? Well, it doesn't permit entrance to what Jesus prohibits is one reason. We have to go in one at a time. and walk generally in single file. It may lead to significant challenges and we have to do things God's way, but here's the thing and it, I won't press this too long. If we go the broad way where there are lots of people and it's very easy. And you know, we even see people in the Lake District walking in flip-flops. Ultimately, it will lead to destruction. It seems all right, but it isn't. Whereas the way we go will lead to life. Surely that's where we want to go, isn't it? But we do need to make sure we're equipped properly with our feet shod with the gospel of peace, for example. So, let's wrap this up. Charles Kingsley, by the way, said, what I want is not to possess religion, but a religion that shall possess me. So as we come into land now, like Jesus, we can choose to enter into his way of doing things. There was no narrower way surely than the cross. 
It cost him everything. And keeping on the narrow way. And it is the persistent walking on that will help us reach our destination. Some days I remember to ask, seek and knock. And on those days, I find my life is fulfilling, exhilarating, liberating. And he always gives me so much more than I ask for. On other days, I forget, and I'm a pain in the neck to live with, and I don't make much progress. How are you doing? Are you struggling? Do you want to change? I'm reminded of someone who was always asking, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? He was always seeking the sheep, the coin, the sun. And here in this picture, which Don and I had, it's one of the pictures, first pictures we ever had when we were first married. We had it up in our flat. Jesus knocks, and he's knocking always for us. Today, he's knocking. Behold, he says, I stand at your door and knock. The most intentional and persistent of requests. If anyone, you, will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat. He is knocking today for me and for you. Let's just close our eyes. I wonder, do I pray persistently to live each day in a way that follows the Sermon on the Mount teaching? And if not, will I start? Will I start to be persistent in praying? If you want that to be you, ask now. Help me be persistent in prayer. Do I persistently practice the golden rule? Am I persistent in loving and doing to others what I want them to do to me? Do I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, strength and my neighbour as myself? And if you want to be persistent, seek that now. May I love you, Lord, with all my heart. May I love my neighbour as myself. Help me, Lord. Or do I need to stop glancing over at the broad way and persist in walking further than the narrow way? Why not knock? Help me in my walking, Lord. Help me in my walking. Help me in my walking. The whole of this passage can be summed up in two words. And it's a wonderful encouragement. Keep going. Dear friend this morning, keep going. Keep going. You know, I had this picture when we were praying before of someone with a stone in their shoe. And it's, you're hobbling. Stop now and bend down and take the shoe off and get the stone out, for goodness sake.
Have you given up on a situation you're living with? Keep going. Why? Why? Because I love you, says the Lord, and I hear you, and I will give, I will answer, and I will open. And you'll see what's the other side of that door when you come in and sup with me.